Go ahead. All right, thank you, Dr. Altman, and, th and thank you for having me today. Um, I appreciate your, your attendance. Uh, today, we're gonna, like Dr. Altman said, we're gonna talk about the manufacture, the standardization and the use of allergen extracts. And my intent is to take you from the field to the patient. Uh, I, my name is Shannon Brown, and I disclose, as Dr. Altman said, that I am a full-time employee of Jubilant Hollister Sear. Um, the Jubilant came to be, uh, 10 or 12 years ago when we were purchased by a company in India, uh, but we are still known to those in the field as Hollister Steer Allergy. Um, I have no other relevant disclosures. Um, a little bit about me, I have been working for the company for about uh, 16 years. Uh, I worked with Derek Constable, who gave this presentation last year. If you were on, he may you may remember him. He has since retired. Um, and just a, a, a disclosure, if I say we throughout the pr presentation, I really am referring to the allergy manufacturers as a whole and not Jubilant Hollister Sear um, individually as, a, as my uh, employer. So let's take a minute to look at the three uh, key learning objectives for today. My intent is to provide some context so that you can better understand the manufacturing process for allergen extracts. So you can understand what it means for allergen extracts to be standardized versus non-standardized. And to understand, or I guess really to reinforce the best practices for the preparation of individual patient treatment sets. And during today's presentation, um, I will take you from the source or from from the raw material to the patient. And in order to take things that people are allergic from, from the source material to a pharmaceutical extract that is safe for injection in patients, the materials have to go through the following general process. And we'll go through each one of these in step and I'll provide you some examples using some of the common allergens. So it starts with the raw material and the raw material processing. And we'll look at four different common allergen groups um, as I step you through uh, what the processing of the raw material looks like. We'll look at pollens, venoms, house dust mite, and the animal hair and danders. For pollen, raw material is either collected from its natural environment or it is cultivated under controlled conditions. Uh, collection can be done in-house by the allergen manufacturers themselves or using suppliers uh, from throughout the country. At a high level, the pollen has to be cleaned and dried, which is often done using a simple sieving technique or a fine particle separation, which is commonly vortexing. And all the materials must meet FDA and quality guidelines of having less than one percent foreign material, and they have to be identified by a botanist. The next slide illustrates um, the collection period for many of the common pollen allergens. It shows the pollens are collected over approximately a nine month period to capture all the relevant allergens. The red bars represent the expected collection period and the pink bars represent the variability of that collection period. Because collection times can shift depending on the climate or the particular weather of the season, collectors have to monitor the seasons closely so that they don't miss a harvest period. And they're often juggling the harvest of multiple different allergens at the same time. It's critical if we, if we miss a harvest season, we miss it for a whole year. So it's very important um, to have a strong collection network. So pollen can be gathered manually by hand picking, which is a pretty labor intensive process, or you can use specialized vacuum equipment like the one shown in this picture here that is essentially vacuuming up pollen from the pollinating plants. Pollen can be collected um, from pure stands, which are grown outside, or from water setting harvested plants. And you'll note that the, there's simple white paper put on the tables, but that's where a lot of the pollen will fall and collect onto. So it is, it's a pretty simple process, 
um, but obviously critical uh, to product uh, availability. Once collected, the pollen is moved to a processing facility where it's dried. And these areas are highly controlled and they're isolated to prevent cross-contamination. You know, for example, there's one species uh, is allowed per isolated room. The air, heat, and humidity supply is independent and controlled for each room, as is the air that's incoming or exhausted is filtered. The rooms are set up to have cleanable surfaces um, to minimize texture and fibrous material so that they can be easily cleaned uh, between uses. And after each use, uh, they're tested for cleanliness to ensure that there's not cross-contamination. So the, the pictures below gives us an example um, of how the dried plants are separated from the pollen by sieving. This technician, as you can see, is first uh, wearing her appropriate personal protective equipment so that she doesn't develop sensitivities to the pollens. Um, the plant material is dried on paper and then put into this as a sieve um, where the fine particles, uh, pollen grains fall through and then the um, remaining material can be discarded. This is a picture here. It's an example um, of a vortex machine to, re excuse me, to uh, separate the fine pollen grains. And again, we're aiming for greater than equal to 99% purity um, at the raw material processing stage. <clears throat> we'll move to venoms. To collect honeybee venom, an electrostimulation grid is set up at the entrance to hives. A mild electrical current is applied that causes the bees to involuntarily sting downward, which deposits a drop of pure venom on a glass plate. The bee is unharmed and the venom air dries and the resulting crystals can be scraped off that plate. And that is the source material that is provided to the manufacturers. This is a little bit in contrast to the other Vespid venoms. Allergen manufacturers rely on a network of nationwide collectors um, who uh, find and collect the whole insects and then freeze them for shipment to the allergy manufacturers. Uh, there are requirements that the material be not more than 5% male and again, not more than 1% extraneous material. And these are part of the quality checks before it enters the facility. As depicted in the pictures, uh, you look for the stinger and one by one, you pull out the venom sacs. They're individually dissected and placed in solution. The venom sacs are clear and uncloudy and then they get forward processed to isolate the venom components. Um, typically, um, you'll notice that there are no gloves worn by this technician. Um, this, that's for just illustration only. Uh, in a commercial manufacturing process, this technician would be wearing gloves and all the appropriate personal protective equipment. Uh, fun fact, it does take about 10 to 30 insects to create one dose or 100 micrograms of venom. So there are typically several people working full time just dissecting uh, venom insects. For mites, uh, insects are not collected from the wild, but they're propagated in a controlled manner. A growth medium which contains the feed material is inoculated with the mite seed culture. They're incubated at a defined temperature and humidity, and then harvested based on the body mass or the body density of, of the mites. The mite bodies then need to be separated from the spent media and dried. And again, this process typically involves some type of sieving or separation and then uh, with a target of less than 1% non-mite bodies. So you go from thousands or millions of these critters into a dried mass of the bodies. 
Um, each company has its own trade secrets regarding the specific growth media, including the feed material that's used. But they all go through typically the same process. For animal hair and dander source material, hair is collected from qualified veterinarians who can certify that it is collected from healthy animals. There are no restrictions on breed as there's no breed specific allergens other than there's not more than 25% of any one breed in a lot. Uh, the incoming hair and dander is in, inspected for foreign material and also to ensure that the consistent, the appearance of the hair is consistent with the correct animal type. And there are specifications um, around both of these uh, for the incoming inspection process. So then the source material moves from to extraction and a fill finish process. For some allergens, you know, additional intermediate processing is required to enhance the extract. Others can go straight from the extraction and clarification process to the fill finish process. And all extracts finish in the quality control department and then with quality assurance for review, inspection, and release. There are also uh, quality checks throughout the process, including environmental controls. A start to finish, this can typically take three to four months to take the material from the source material to the finished product. Some allergens take longer because of a more complicated process or because they require FDA release. And then the materials are stored at refrigerated uh, conditions until shipped to our customers. So we'll go through the extraction process first. Um, all manufacturing processes here start with the extraction of the raw material in a suitable fluid and under conditions that promote the release of the allergens, but also maintain the stability and the bacterial protection of for the allergens. Um, most allergens, for example, pollens and epithelials rely on a passive elution of the allergens into the extraction fluid. Extraction can be enhanced by stirring at room temperature for several hours or up to several days. And then allergens will be released naturally, either for example, through the germination pores of the pollen, or in the case of hair fiber, they can be dissolved flushed and dissolved off the surface, surface of the hair fiber, which these two pictures are showing. Other materials, and uh, for example, mites and the venom sacs require an active disruption to release the allergens. Because mite whole bodies have a hard exoskeleton, they must be split open first to release the majority of their allergens. And this is often done by you know, a physical maceration. This is a picture of a ball mill. It's on a roller system in which the mites and some um, solid uh, beads are put inside that jar and it's rolled for a, a designated period. And that causes the mite exoskeletons to break open and release the allergens. In the case of those venom sacs that we talked about, they are often broken open using a homogenizer. And this is just one illustration of a homogenizer and how that works. The idea is to just split open those sacs and release uh, the venom material. I mentioned before that it's critical throughout the manufacturing process to maintain the stability of the extracted proteins and allergens. Typically, 50% uh, glycerin is used. It's the extraction fluid of choice for most of those allergens. And glycerin acts to stabilize the conformational structure by coating the allergenic proteins and reducing the surface bound water. The downside about using 50% glycerin in vaccines is that it can be painful to inject in the patient. Non-glycerin extraction fluids can also be used, though increasingly they're less common. They don't provide uh, stability unless you add a stabilizing agent. A common example used um, in, in treatment set preparations is a 0.03 human serum albumin solution. 
um, that helps dilute extracts, uh, the protein state more stable. It is also important to keep the bacterial growth in check during the manufacturing process. The intent is to keep the total bacterial load to not load low to not add excessive load to the downstream sterilizing filters. And one of the advantages of using the 50% glycerin solution is that it has bacterial static properties and prevents the growth of the bacteria throughout each stage of the manufacturing process. This eliminates the necessity for other bactericides such as phenol. One of the downsides of that is it does make um, clarification more difficult um, because of the density of the material. Non-glycerin extract fluids that lack glycerin uh, need to have a 0.4% phenol added to provide protection against bacterial growth. And although it is safe, it can often have detrimental effects on proteins, especially in a, in a very dilute solution. And again, the 0.03% human serum albumin is sometimes added um, to help partially protect against that effect. After extraction is complete, uh, the next step is to remove the bulk of the insoluble material. And, and for example, we're talking about the hair, the pollen grains, those mite exoskeleton pieces that I mentioned before. Those all have to be removed. And typically that's done using either centrifugation or depth filtration, depending on the consistency of the, of the mixture. Once the majority of the solids have been removed, it can be further clarified using a series of progressively smaller pore size membrane filters down to about 0.2 microns. And at this stage, most of the particulates and the bacteria are removed, but it's not considered sterile yet because this hasn't been done in a sterile environment. So each of these pictures shows um, what some of the processing equipment may be. It may be as simple as a Buchner funnel. This is a picture um, of one type of centrifuge that can be used to remove the gross solids. This is the next step. It will go through a depth filter. This picture depicts it cut open so you can see what that inside material looks like. And then this is a picture of a membrane filter that would be the, the final clarification step before it goes to the sterile filtration process. As I mentioned before, some of these products have to go through some additional um, processing um, in order to um, concentrate or alter their presentation. And one of the a commonly used process in the industry is called tangential flow filtration. And it's essentially a dialysis or an ultra filtration process. You select a membrane that has a molecular weight cutoff that retains the proteins of interest, but eliminates the low molecular weight proteins and compounds um, that, that may be also present in that crude extract. You know, as this picture illustrates, the feed stream, this is the extract stream, is swept over the membrane to minimize buildup at the surface. The components that are smaller than the molecular weight cutoff of the membrane pass through to the permeate, which is discarded. And the, and the compounds of interest, which are the higher molecular weight proteins, get retained in this retentate feed. And if you cycle this several times, it concentrates that extract. This is an illustration of a, a larger, uh, it's really a small scale production size equipment. Your membrane is housed here, and then you have your retentate tank, and the material recirculates through until it's at the desired concentration. So that is one way that we actively um, enhance the, man, the extraction process. The other way is using uh, precipitation. Now, most of us want to avoid precipitation in our extracts, but allergy manufacturers can also use it to their advantage. Um, it's a way of concentrating the allergens that can't otherwise be prepared to a suitable therapeutic concentration. And what we do, either using a salting out process or a solvent precipitation, such as acetone, 
is we alter the conditions around those proteins and allergens to force them out of solution. They are then collected and then the concentrated intermediates can either be vacuum dried or lyophilized depending on their state. And this is just an illustration of a, a raw material or an extract that's been processed to this intermediate um, precipitated raw material stage. When the extraction and clarification and any enhanced processing is complete, um, the extract is sterile filtered using either a 0.1 or a 0.2 micron filter, depending on the product, and it's sterile filtered into a sterile filling core. The product is then filled into its final container vial under ISO 5 conditions. Um, and, and depending on the batch size, uh, manufacturers will use either a high speed filling line or they will do manual fills um, for smaller lots. And these two pictures just depict um, what that filling line looks like. And as you can see in an ISO 5 area, um, the technician is completely gowned and isolated from the product, but is there for intervention if needed. This is just a close up of that filling nozzle filling some uh, vials. And then in the case of a lyophilized product such as Venom, they are loaded, unloaded um, in, a, in a sterile state into the lyophilizer. After the fill finish is complete, um, all products go to the quality control lab for testing and release of the finished product. They must meet predefined specifications in order to be released to market. And so we will we'll talk about testing here for a minute. Um, first, let's talk about standardization versus non-standardization. So in general, we have two designations of allergen extracts. We have those that have no US standard of potency, and these are referred to as non-standardized extracts. And they're typically labeled with weight volume. These extracts require uh, the following testing, uh, sterility, safety, appearance, and a protein content. Standardized extracts um, are defined because there is a US standard of potency for this group of extracts. And they're typically labeled with that potency measure. These extracts get the same testing as the non-standardized plus the FDA mandated potency assay. So FDA has developed methods for a limited range of extracts that we have designated as standardized. There are nine grasses, five hymenoptera venoms, two species of mites, and cat hair and pelt extracts that are considered standardized. And this is in contrast to over 200 allergens that have no US standard of potency. So it is really a small class or a small group of the allergens um, in the total product line. So there are generally three categories or types of methods that the FDA um, has created in order to standardize these products. So the first is a major by major allergen content. And these are really for extracts that are characterized by the presence of a single major allergen. The method um, that's used is a radial immunodiffusion assay. And this is how the Feldy one in cat and the Ambe one in short ragweed are quantified. Now I will note that a lot of people think of major allergen in terms of micrograms per milliliter. And though that is generally established using a major allergen ELISA method. And to date, there are no major allergen ELISA methods that are used to test, um, to test and release standardized materials. Um, there are some that are used for research and internal development um, only. However, the FDA is working on a couple ELISA methods um, as a replacement for these older style major allergen assays. The second type of assay is an enzyme assay, and it's for extracts with allergens characterized by an enzyme. 
And it uses a similar system to the major allergen in that it's a radial diffusion assay. And uh, for example, phospholipase A or hyaluronidase in venom are two components, two enzymes that are measured um, in this way for standardization. The third major category of method for standardization is the ELISA relative potency assay. And for those familiar with ELISA, this is an inhibition um, ELISA. And it's used for the, all the standardized grasses and the standardized mites. And really it's to characterize extracts that have a more complex mixture of allergens. And we'll go through each one of these in a little bit more detail. Um, here is a depiction of the format for the radial immunodiffusion and the radial diffusion assay systems. Uh, these are the ones that are used for a single major allergen or an enzyme uh, characterized extract. A gel is prepared containing either the antibody, uh, for example, to cat or ragweed, or the enzyme substrate in the case of the venoms. The diluted antigen or the extract and the standards are added to the wells that are punched in the gel. The antigen then diffuses to the surrounding gel and creates either a precipitation ring or a substrate, substrate clearance. And what you can see is increasing concentrations lead to a larger diameter ring. The area of that ring is proportional to the antigen or the enzyme quantity. So the standard is plotted based on diameter of the precipitate ring versus the concentration of the antigen. And then the concentration of samples is simply read off this, read off the line. As an example, um, the Sieber Feldy 1 range, to be labeled 10,000 BAUs, the units have to fall between 10 and 19.9 units per mil. For AMBE 1 to be labeled our 1 to 20 weight volume, the units have to be between 101 and 200 units. However, we have to keep in mind that allergy extracts often have a more com complete and complex um, mix of clinically relevant allergens. And although not necessarily a part of product release, we often do protein gels or Western blotting of these allergen extracts against patient serum um, that illustrates the complexity of these extracts. So here's an example using um, Russian thistle, and this is a protein profile using SDS page, looks like with silver staining, and then an immune allergen immunoblot that identifies several allergens and several proteins. And this just illustrates that in many cases, a single allergen may not be adequate as a potency measure for the extract. And in those cases, we use the standardized ELISA relative potency method. Now, originally, the standardized potency values for the ELISA relative potency method were established by a skin test titration study to ensure that the potency values that were assigned were based on clinical reactivity. And this method was called the ideal 50 method. As part of the study, um, 15 to 20 highly sensitive subjects were enrolled. This was determined by puncture test um, with a concentrated extract where the urethema diameter was greater than 80 millimeters. The subjects were then given intradermal injections. Uh, it was a sequence of a threefold serial diluted extract. This is referred to as the ID endpoint titration method. And then they calculated the threefold dilution of the extract that was required to produce an urethema diameter of 50 millimeters. The assignment of the bioequivalent bio allergy units, or BAUs per milliliter, was based on that mean calculated dilution. And the next slide shows a, a graphical representation of what that study data uh, could have looked like, where they plotted the sum of the diameters against the threefold dilution number. And then you simply plot a regression line and look for the threefold dilution number that gave you a 50 millimeter diameter urethema. 
And then based on that, the potency values were assigned. Um, and in this case, if that mean diameter fell between 13 and 15, we can go back. So somewhere in this range, which is a you know, fairly broad range, it was labeled as a 100,000 BAU per milliliter potency. If it fell lower than that in the 10.9 to 12.9 range, it was labeled as a 10,000 BAU per milliliter extract. Now a note, this ideal 50 method uh, was used originally to establish these potency ranges, but it is not used every time there's a new reference standard. Typically, FDA purchases a batch of released extract from one of the major um, extract manufacturers, and then the FDA and the, manu the manufacturers evaluate that new reference standard against the old to see if it's producing consistent results. When everyone is happy with it, then they release it for distribution to the allergy manufacturers for lot release and stability testing. So the ideal 50 method is really to establish the initial potency of the initial reference standard. So how does this translate to industry for product release? So what happens, as I mentioned, is the FDA provides the calibrated standards and a serum pool that is derived from patients allergic to that respective allergen. Each lab uses uh, an ELISA method to compare the activity of the commercial production batch to that standard. And if they're equivalent, the batch can be assigned the appropriate potency and released. This is an example of the, of the range of the ELISA relative potency value that would equate to a label of 10,000 BAU per mils. If you have six replicates tested, the, the value can fall within the range 0.776 to 1.288 to be called a 10,000 BAU per milliliter product. Continuing with our ERP example, ELISA relative potency, this, it represents the results that you would typically see in ELISA relative potency assay, in which the response of the sample, and the sample is here in black, is compared to the response of the reference. The x-axis is increased dilutions of the product, and it's against, um, this is measuring the response signal against those dilutions. First, there are criteria that must be met to show that the slope of the sample and the slope of the reference are equivalent for the assay to be valid. And then you can look at the offset of the sample slope versus the reference to determine this relative potency. Essentially, if it's shifted left, you're gonna have an ELISA relative potency value slightly higher than the reference, which is assigned one. If it's actually shifted to the right, then it's going to be slightly lower. And that's just based on this ratio of reference to sample. So again, if it falls within this broad range, then it's labeled as a 10,000 BAU per milliliter product. Okay, so that wraps up our manufacturing and um, testing sections of how um, a source material is manufactured through to a sterile liquid injectable. Now we're gonna talk about this fourth phase, which is the formulation of treatment sets. Now, I, I'm not sure um, who all is on the call. So a lot of this just may be a refresher and a reminder, um, cause you may do this every day in your practice. Um, so in general, there's, there's two main schools of thought around the formulation of treatment sets. The first is in following quad AI and ACAAI methods, which the treatment set is formulated using um, FDA standards of potency in the case of standardized uh, extracts or the label claim based on non-standardized extracts. And that really goes back uh, to the practice parameters and the recommendations given in the, in the practice parameters. An alternative method um, is based on major allergen content. Um, and again, you know, the, it's at the physician's discretion uh, for the method of choice for their practice. But we'll go to, through these and um, I can give some examples. So this table is taken out of the practice parameters and it shows that for each uh, major type of allergen extract, 
including non-standardized, uh, there is listed a probable effective dose range. Now where possible, these are supported by studies in the field. As you can see, these are primarily listed by potency for those that are standardized. There is some listed, one listed for, by major allergen content in terms of micrograms per milliliter. And then for non-standardized product, again, it is listed as a volume for a particular weight volume extract. So these are the probable doses that have shown to be effective in immunotherapy. So the pro of using the um, quad AI, ACAI method and that where you're using FDA standardized or the weight volume label is that it's consistent as far as the reference and the method. There are comparable results from lot to lot and from company to company. And all this represents all allergen components um, contributing to the po total potency, which is a more holistic approach. On the, on the con side, you know, it cannot, you're not measuring contribution of individual allergens, and it requires um, in that standardization method an atopic serum pool that can be difficult to replace and with consistency. The alternative method, which is dosing by the major allergen content, is relatively straightforward because you're targeting a maintenance dose based on micrograms of a single allergen. And it works well for those simple extracts where it's generally agreed that a single allergen is dominant. Uh, the con is that there's no universal agreed upon reference or method available for this type of major allergen. So there are differences uh, between manufacturers and, and uh, it, who use different test systems. And the single allergen we have to keep in mind not, may not be reflective of the total extract potency. But let's go through an example. So the first step of formulation is to create a customized allergen mix such that that probable effective dose for each component is present in the targeted maintenance dose volume. And really there's four or five pieces of information that we need to do that. We need to know what allergens are going to be included in the treatment set. We need to know the probable effective dose for each of those allergens. We need to know what our clinic typically uses as the maintenance dose, and, and that's often 0.3 to 0.5 milliliters. We need to know the potency of the bulk extract, and we need to know um, how much volume our, our clinic typically makes in that concentrated or that red vial, um, excuse me, the red uh, treatment set vial. And just for illustrative purposes, we're going to work through an example. Um, and, and again, treatment sets should be based on the allergens that are relevant to the individual patient. And that's based on, you know, a complete medical history and any supporting diagnostic tests. For this example, our patient has been um, diagnosed with allergies to Timothy pollen, oak pollen, standardized cat hair, standardized mite, and a feather mix. We know that in our, in our theoretical practice that we typically make a five milliliter um, concentrate volume, and we typically inject 0.5 milliliters um, of, that, of that concentrate. We would go to the practice parameters for those probable effective doses. And in our case, we're gonna select the upper end of that range, bearing in mind that the higher dose may have greater potential for effective outcomes. So we'll go just through high level. We'll, we'll need to calculate the volumes of the extracts. Um, and we'll start with the ones that are labeled in units per milliliter or concentration. Again, we know what the probable effective dose is. We know what the bulk concentrate is, concentration is. And we know that we typically make five milliliters with a maintenance dose of 0.5 mils. So the first step is to figure out the concentration in Timothy that needs to be in that final treatment vial to achieve the probable effective dose. And that's simply taking that target concentration and dividing by the maintenance dose 
to know that we need a concentration of 8,000 BAUs per milliliter. We know to get there from 100,000 BAU per milliliter um, bulk solution and to make five mils, that that would require 0.4 milliliters of the Timothy bulk. Now we can go through this exercise for each of the products that are labeled in concentration. But we also can go through the calculation for the extracts that are labeled in weight volume for the non-standardized. And again, we need to know the concentration as expressed in weight volume. We need to know the concentration of the bulk, the vial size, and the maintenance dose. And this is just a ratio of the bulk to the target, and then multiplying that ratio by the total volume to know that you have to have one mils of oak pollen bulk. Now I am going through this rather quickly because I'm trying to be conscious of our, our total time. So if there's questions, um, most certainly we can go through those after. So you go through th this calculation with each of the individual components. And in this case, we get a total volume that exceeds the total capacity of our maintenance vial. So we have a couple options to consider when we're gonna make an adjustment. We could keep all the extracts in one vial and go back to using a minimum target dose. So instead of dosing at the high range, we dose at the low range, which would reduce the amount of concentrate needed in the vial. We're down to 2.35 mils, which you would then bring up to five mils with the diluent. So that's option one. Option two is you can adjust the volume to a volume between the minimum and the maximum dose. And this is, can be helpful when you want to uh, bias the maintenance towards the patient critical allergens. So this graph just shows what the maximum volume, the minimum volume, and then an intermediate volume somewhere between the two, the min and max would be. And in this case, we could formulate it <clears throat> so that the components um, totaled to the five milliliters. So that is the second option. Or a third option is if you want to keep that maximum dose, you can split it between two treatment sets. So there's, there's quite a bit of flexibility um, in the approach depending on the individual patient and their needs. And I'll wrap up by just giving a few extra additional points to consider, which are probably known to all of you. Extracts, there are some extracts that have very high protease activity. And if they're in the same vials as other extracts, they can degrade these allergens. So uh, particularly for molds and cockroach, it's best practice to put these in vials by themselves. Uh, we know that we have to aseptically prepare our patient vials, and then we can make our treatment sense from that maintenance vial using tenfold dilutions. We store these extracts at two to eight to reduce uh, the loss of potency. And also those color-coded tops that I showed a few slides ago are another great way to reduce error in the practice. So with that, I will wrap up. Uh, for those of you who, are, who, are, um, who need it, the word of the day is extract. And I do want to thank you all for your attention and I will open it up for questions. I think we have about seven minutes or so um, to wrap up and try and answer any questions that you may have. Shannon, thank you uh, very much. You've left us uh, a fair amount of time. Um, how many, uh, how many major manufacturers do we have in the US and worldwide for that matter? Oh, that's a great question. So the three primary manufacturers in the US are uh, Jubilant Hollister Steer, uh, ALK, and Stallergens Greer. Um, and then worldwide, uh, Jubilant Hollister Steer has a fairly small presence worldwide. I, ALK and Stallergens have a much larger presence worldwide. Um, and I, I don't know off the top of my head, I can't give you the list of other particularly European countries um, that supply that market. But certainly in the US, it's the three, the three main companies. When you dissect out the venom sacs, does that kill the insect? So the, yeah, the insects come killed. So they are, they are um, expired before they come to us. And that happens. Oh. When, when the uh, collectors freeze the insects, um, they are killed at that point. And then we receive them and thaw them before we dissect out the, the venom sex. We had a talk earlier in the year about venom 
allergy and venom immunotherapy. And, you know, since we know the protein allergens, it seems to me awfully tedious to extract out the venom sacs. Does anybody consider just synthesizing the relevant enzymes and making a vaccine, a synthetic vaccine? Right. No, that's a great question. I, th I think that um, that is something a lot of people have interest in. Um, I think the challenge is um, of bringing, there are challenges with bringing a new product to market. Um, as you know, these extracts have been, you know, a, a part of the medical community for, you know, almost 100 years. Um, and so to make a change or to bring a new product um, comes with it a, a significant amount of clinical trial requirements um, and approval from the FDA. So while it is of interest for, for a lot of people to focus more on specific, um, specific allergen treatment, um, right now, at least I know, you know, um, our company is, is still focused on providing that whole extract. We have others with questions. I have a question. You hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can. This is Mike Kennedy. I and I uh, worked for a beekeeper way long ago when I was a, a high school student, and the bees. Uh, we were aware that the venoms from the honeybee was continually pumped into your skin after the bee left, and they left behind their stinger and the sack of venom. That was the common knowledge. Now I noticed from your presentation that your honeybee venom collection, the bees do not die. They just squirt their venom into a little grid. Is that really true? Yeah, yeah, that, that's how it's collected. And I think that's part of the reason why, you know, it, it probably takes um, a higher amount of that venom um, to formulate you know, the dose versus um, a natural sting where it is continually infusing. Um, well, that's, that's gratifying to know that the honeybees don't have to be killed. That's yes. Nice. No, we but, don't want to kill the honeybees. We, we <laughs> the honeybees, right? Keep, keep good, them, good. protect them. Yep. And Thank that's you. Done, we, that's done by a, a, a supplier. So, um, you know, Hollister Sear is the only manufacturer of, of venoms in the U.S., but we, we purchase that, um, that dried material from a supplier. Um, it's not part of our in internal operation or network to do that ourselves. Do you follow the same processes for making uh, the tablets for sublingual immunotherapy? And, and then how do you change the process to formulate those tablets? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I am not as familiar with the tablets. My, my, my guess would be that the initial extraction process is very similar. Um, and then they get to some kind of uh, dried, um, dried material, um, probably a lyophilized material that is combined with other agents to formulate the tab tablet, but I don't have ex direct experience with tab tablet formulation. But that might be a, another great um, lecture series uh, lesson. Hi there, you know, this is Vinod Doris Kwame. You know, I had a two question. Thank you for the talk, by the way, it was excellent. So, and thanks for the respect here. You know. Uh, um, one was, you know, is there an easy way, you know, for the non to extract, you know, convert some from PNU units to actual, you know, speak up, but we can't hear you. Sorry, just one second. Give me one second. <clears throat> so um, this is Vinod Dureshwami. I had a question, two questions. One is, is there an easy conversion for you uh, from PNU units to volumes that, you know, in the, you know, we don't, I don't really use PNU very much. The second was a couple of years ago, we still went through shortages of uh, some of the venoms, you know, do we see anything kind of in the pipeline in terms of, you know, is there any issues coming up with regards to not having adequate venoms or some of the extracts? Mm -hmm. No, th those are both great questions. So, you know, unfortunately, there's there's not a great 
conversion of PNU to weight volume. Um, we, we have plotted this a number of times to see if we can provide anything uh, to clinicians um, as an easy reference, but um, it can be very product specific. Uh, there's not necessarily a nice clean uh, a regression line uh, to, to convert it. Um, on the question of supply issues, um, you know, as you know, several years ago when we became the sole, sole supplier, when uh, Hollister Shear became the sole supplier of Venoms, um, we went through a process where we had to increase our output um, to supply the market. And in, in doing that, um, you know, obviously there's always growing pains, but, but we, are, we are to the point now where we feel like we have the equipment and um, the capacity to supply that market. And so we are always very keenly aware um, of having a consistent supply um, because we are the sole manufacturer in the United States. And so um, that's something that's always a focus. As far as um, reliability of the other extracts, um, you know, um, because these are biological materials, sometimes there is some fluctuation and all the companies um, try, try to set up their, um, their source material supply so that we have a sufficient safety stock. So if there was ever a disruption um, in the market or that a pollen season got missed for the collection that we would have enough to su supply us. So it's, it's something that's always being looked at um, and we are, we went through a project and I'm sure ALK and, and Greer does also, um, where they're trying to balance uh, the quantity of their safety stock and their production um, with the cost of keeping that material. And so, we, you know, the objective is always to have the material available to supply to customers because we know how disruptive that is in your office if it's not available. So I, you know, I can't, there's no 100% guarantee but we, we are making um, and changing a lot of uh, processes so that uh, we can improve that reliability. Is all of your work done in Spokane? It yeah. is. Yeah, uh, not all the collection, um, but yes, all the processing is done in Spokane. 